Hey everyone, welcome back for week number three in Bio 20. Because we have Labor Day on Monday, this week actually isn't as long, so I still have the two parts for the videos because class isn't interfering with Tuesday, but it's not as long because technically you don't have class on Monday or any type of school, so I have adjusted accordingly. Also, as you look, so part one is going to deal with what's alive and how we deal with classification of organisms. Part two is going to deal with looking at cell parts. So this unfortunately is like all the terminology that tends to freak people out. So that's also why, because it's just a lot of words. Your assignment for this week is going to be a group project based upon your lab group. You're going to be making a very short video, like two minutes at max, talking about a disorder that could exist due to a cell part going wrong. Lab this week, we're dealing with metrics. We are going to be doing math, so I would bring a calculator that you trust that you know how to use. Otherwise, you have to use the ones that we have in the lab, and you're at the mercy of whether those work or not. And then lab number two will be due Saturday at midnight. So part number one, we're going to deal with living things. So topic number one is that we have common characteristics amongst the living organisms. So you should be able to listen, describe characteristics found of life, and then tell me what emergent height or emergent properties turn out to be. So in the original version of this, the picture that you see was animated, but since I turned it into a PDF, you don't get to see it that way. If this class were in person, you would see the animated fire. Anyway, one of the questions that's worth asking is, what does it mean to be alive? And the way to answer that is we need to look at things that seem like they could be alive, but we know they aren't. So we could then attempt to figure out what's the difference between us and these other objects. Well, fire can do things that we can do. So if you think about what fire is capable of doing, it can react like we can react. So if you blow on fire, it will change how it's behaving. It's capable of growing and dying. You can make it reproduce. It is capable of doing some chemistry. It actually makes molecules and in a sense, like it can communicate because if you have flames nearby, it can cause it to jump immediately. So it's like a little bit of a communication type deal. So the catch is what, why is fire not alive, but it's doing things that we know living things do. So, if we look at living things, fire can hit some of those big obvious ones. They can reproduce, they can grow and die, they use energy, they can respond. But living things are more than just this. This turns out to be an image that I pulled out a few years ago of one of the fires from Northern California. When we look at living things, as opposed to fire, there are some characteristics that are a bit more nuanced that living things do, that non-living things are incapable of doing. One such thing is this term called homeostasis. So the term homeostasis is maintaining yourself, meaning something's trying to like stop the fire, so the fire has a mechanism to fight back. No, the fire, if it goes out, it goes out. But for us, if you have a mechanism where you're being deprived of oxygen, you're going to do things to try and regain that oxygen. If you are in the situation where you have too much fluids, too many fluids in your body, you're going to do something to get rid of some of those excess fluids. Homeostasis is staying alive, and part of that comes with you're going to do what it takes to stay alive. We pass along genetic information so when we reproduce, there's information that moves from starting point to whatever comes next to them, whatever comes next to whatever comes next. So the information that made you came from your parents. And your parents got that information from their parents, and they from their parents, so on and so on. So we have this passing on of information from generation to generation. That does not happen with fire, because fire is just fire. Living things turn out to be very organized. So it's not just we have fire and there's an orangey part and there's a blue part and there's a yellow part and a clear part. 
When we say organized structures, we're going to talk about levels of organization. And what we mean by that is we'll have a base foundation that is needed to make the next level of organization, which is needed to make the next level of organization, which is needed to make the next level of organization. We're going to see that momentarily. They also develop, meaning there's changes in the structure and function over time. If you think of us, babies and us are not the same. We have the same parts, but the proportions are all wrong. The functioning is all wrong. If you think of like seeds and plants, the seed is not the plant. You could tell how the seed or the plant like will mature and if it flowers, it's eventually gonna flower and then maybe eventually produce fruits. If you think about things like I don't know, butterflies, which would start out as an egg, then they hatch, and then you have you know, a caterpillar, which will then form that chrysalis, and then it reemerges as a butterfly just to lay eggs. So we have this weird, we have this pattern of development over time. It's not just the same thing. We can call that embedded organization an emergent property. This can be described as the sum is greater than its parts. And what we mean by that is if I were to look at any type of organism or any, it doesn't matter, organism, anything, it's composed of parts. So molecules are composed of atoms. Atoms can do certain things, but when they're arranged in, the, in a particular way, we can create molecules like lipids, carbohydrates, proteins, nucleic acids. You click all, if you take those four compounds and salts and water and stuff like that, you can build cells which are capable of doing things that those molecules individually can't. Namely, cells are where there's life. And then we can take these cells and we can arrange them in certain patterns and we can create tissues. And tissues do things that cells can't. And then those tissues can make organs and organ systems which do things that the tissues can't, which definitely do things the cells can't which we can use to make an organism. But organisms by themselves aren't, don't do too much. We need to have a group of them, a population, and we get new dynamics that result from the population that we don't see with individuals. And then we can cluster those groups of populations into other groups with other populations. We call those communities. And then we can take the communities and put them into a physical context. We call that an ecosystem. Then we can look at the patterns of those ecosystems, and we call that the biosphere. Each of these is a layer of complexity, a layer of organization that's not just here's the orange part, here's the blue part. We build on itself, and that is one of the big things that comes with life. What we're going to talk about next is how do we break life up into its categories, or at least the categories we use.